free market to improve energy efficiency. Um, this is a series of webinars that NCSL puts on on energy issues, and uh, we uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, today, our panelists uh, have a broad area, a broad depth of expertise in uh, various approaches to um, basically increasing information flow, which uh, in in uh, both rental and purchase. Um, transactions for uh, buildings and uh, through this increased information which is um, brought about through state benchmarking and disclosure policies there can be a uh, motivation for uh, an increase basically in energy efficiency um, throughout the um, throughout this process so let me welcome our first presenter um, James Gallagher who is a senior manager for strategic and corporate planning at the New York Independent System Operator, where he is responsible for establishing the long-term strategic direction for the New York ISO. Prior to joining the New York ISO in January of 2010, he was senior vice president for energy policy at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Um, I wanted to also note that at any time during this uh, presentation or any of the any of our speakers, feel free to type in any questions you may have in the uh, question box, and we will address those between the presenters or at the end of the um, presentations. So uh, let's welcome uh, Jim Gallagher. Thank you very much. And uh, just before I get started, just to say a little bit more background. It was during my time in New York City at the Economic Development Corporation where I also had the role of energy policy advisor to the Mayor Bloomberg's office and I worked closely with the mayor's office in implementing what was referred to as Plan YC which is, uh, includes a range of initiatives to address climate change and also to implement uh, innovative energy policies including one of the policies which I worked closely with the mayor's office on was uh, benchmarking and disclosure. Um, I am also co-chair of one of the uh, C Action working groups, which is going to be the focus of today's discussion, and in particular the uh, the existing commercial buildings working group. So I'd, I'd like to welcome everyone here, and uh, I look forward to a, a good discussion. And let me begin by actually going through our proposed agenda. We, uh, the idea is to, to give you a high-level overview initially of the state and local energy efficiency action uh, team and also uh, program. So I'm going to give you an overview of what C Action is all about. I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about the policies, uh, some of the programs, how you might get involved if there are uh, initiatives that look of interest to you. We want to also uh, dive down in a little more detail and talk about experience with benchmarking and disclosure in one jurisdiction in particular, and that's at Washington, D.C. And uh, lastly, we're going to spend some time talking about some related Department of Energy initiatives leading into what we hope is a good discussion. So with that, let, let me begin by uh, telling you all what C Action is all about and with C Action Overview. You can move to the next slide, please. And C Action is a the state and local energy efficiency action network, and it's a, a state and local effort that's facilitated by the federal government, and in, in this case specifically the Department of Energy and EPA. And the, the whole idea of, uh, of the C Action Network is that it builds on the progress of the National Action Plan for Energy Efficiency, uh, with the notion being that we scale up as quickly as possible in the energy efficiency area, and, and with a very ambitious goal of achieving all cost-effective energy efficiency by 2020. And C Action, in particular, uh, is an effort to try to build upon uh, a lot of the stimulus activities that were made possible through the American Reinvestment Recovery Act. And with the idea being that we implement programs that can leverage private sector activity. Um, C 
the action primarily is designed to help state and local governments do a couple things. And, and one, first and foremost, is advancing energy efficiency policies and, and programs, um, but also removing barriers and disincentives that might exist. And uh, by suggesting and developing model policies that can be considered by states and local governments. If you can move to the next slide. Uh, tell you a little bit about the C Action leadership effort. And it's it's a group of more than 30 stakeholders uh, made up of state and local governments, business leaders, uh, non-government organizations, and the like. And, and the idea is that this is the, the leadership group which oversees uh, eight working groups that have been established to try to help C Action achieve its particular goals. And you can see from the graphic uh, we have working groups that were established in a customer information behavior, uh, evaluation, measurement, verification, uh, the existing commercial buildings working group, which, which we are talking about today and which I co-chair. We have a working group on industrial energy efficiency, combining power, one on building codes, financing, residential retrofits, and then lastly, uh, utility initiatives, and utility energy efficiency. Uh, programs. And the objective of each working group is to develop uh, near-term and long-term energy efficiency goals. And it's, again, very aggressive goals to try to achieve uh, all cost-effective energy efficiency by 2020. But to identify initiatives that can be rolled out um, by state and local governments to, to help achieve these, these targets. Moving uh, on, the commercial working group, which is you know, the group I co-chair, uh, is focusing on existing building stock. And the uh, majority of the office space that's uh, going to be uh, used is, is or has already been built. Um, as many of you on the call already know, that commercial buildings account for over 50 percent of the, the country's building energy use in some dense urban environments like New York City and other large cities. That percentage is even higher. Uh, and they account for 20% of total U.S. energy use in greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a very ripe area for to target for uh, achieving energy efficiency objectives. Um, we're also targeting public buildings. And public buildings are 25% more energy intensive than private buildings. A lot of, a lot of times that's because they're just uh, less efficient. So we we believe strongly in leadership by example, so uh, as you hear the initiatives that we want to roll out, uh, they usually begin with initiatives targeted at public buildings. There's a lot of money being spent on energy in commercial buildings. Uh, uh, in the graphic here, we note that $2 per square foot typically being spent on energy. At the same time, however, uh, the amount spent on energy in existing commercial buildings is a small percentage of the total cost of of owning or operating a building. Uh, New York City, where I'm most familiar with, uh, the cost of energy, although high relative to just about every other city in the country, uh, is still only about 2 to 3 percent of the annual cost per square foot of operating a building. And what we're proposing is, you know, through investments in efficiency should also uh, have economic development benefits. And uh, many of you are familiar with the estimates of jobs created by uh, putting money in energy efficiency. And that the numbers range from 5 to 15 jobs. Um, and also, and, and lastly, efficient buildings have higher occupancy levels, lease rates, and sale prices. And for, for state and local governments, uh, that provides a lot of benefits. I mean, it provides a uh, for state and local governments, uh, higher property taxes, title transfer taxes, and other revenues that are linked to having healthy commercial real estate markets. So it's a we view this as a high priority objective for the the C Action program, and uh, it, it's one of the the most important initiatives that we're trying to roll out right now. Moving on. Um, the commercial working group has identified potential uh, policies and programs in a number of different areas. And I want to, before going too much further, I want to 
uh, acknowledge and thank Glenn Anderson of NCSL, who has been a very active member of the working group and has uh, helped us tremendously in, in all the work that we've been trying to do up to this point. Um, the policy initiatives that we've developed so far and that we've identified include those that we're going to focus on today, which are benchmarking, rating, and disclosure, as well as retro commissioning. Um, high performance leasing policies, as well as strategic energy management programs. Now, in terms of other things that we have underway, uh, we're looking at, uh, I mentioned earlier, ratepayer rate payer funded programs, uh, public-private partnerships, and, and by that we mean where a municipality or a government might lead by example and challenge the private sector to achieve certain uh, aggressive targets. We also believe that uh, we need to do much more in the whole area of uh, efficient operations and investment. And uh, we refer to that as strategic energy management. And I will be getting into that in a little bit more detail as well as uh, the role of what we refer to as high performance leasing. The group is also focusing on efforts that we need to take to build the workforce, and that's through uh, education and training and, and developing materials, and also through certification. And all in all, um, these policies and programs uh, will be a menu of uh, tools that we, we believe can be very helpful to to states and, and local governments as they try to achieve more, energy, more aggressive energy efficiency targets. Um, I'm going to review the benchmarking, rating, and disclosure initiatives, and then in a few minutes, Marshall will give further details regarding how the benchmarking, rating, and disclosure policy in particular has been implemented in, in Washington, D.C. Let me... Uh, now dive down in a little more detail into benchmarking, rating, and disclosure. Essentially, what is it? And bear with me while I get my uh, screen back on. So, what is benchmarking? And and uh, benchmarking is. Uh, uh, it's typically spoken of at the same time as as home as building rating and disclosure and energy benchmarking rating disclosure policies are becoming increasingly common around the country so let me try to break these types of policies down into their three what are often complementary components benchmarking uh, when applied to buildings uh, energy benchmarking it, it's a standardized process for trying to measure how efficiently a building uses energy. And this can be done either comparing that building's energy use uh, relative to either itself over time, to similar buildings, or to a model baseline. And that model baseline could be a building energy code or, or uh, other forms of standard construction practice. And Building energy performance is typically measured for benchmarking purposes in terms of energy use per square foot. Rating is actually then taking the results of that benchmarking effort and giving it a, uh, a numerical score. Uh, it's according to some predetermined scale. Um, EPA's Energy Star Portfolio Manager is one of the 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 tools that is, that is used for rating, and uh, it's a prime example of energy performance rating tool and it, that uses a, a numeric scale, and it will uh, essentially allow you to give a building a score of 1 to 100. And then lastly, disclosure. And disclosure is the, the most important element to really trying to leverage the market, and that's taking the information that comes out of the benchmarking and rating and then making that available uh, to the public or to uh, you know, certain parties to try to facilitate market transformation towards more energy efficient buildings. And that can either be done at the time of a financial transaction or it can be done, as I'll explain, uh, governments posting disclosure, disclosure benchmarking information for broad swaths of the, of the uh, building's market. So 
you know, why do we do this? I mean, why would you have benchmarking, rating, and disclosure? And uh, the belief is that by making this uh, building energy performance data visible, uh, local governments can do a lot towards encouraging building owners to improving the efficiency of their buildings, uh, largely through through market mechanisms. And this has been documented by several recent studies, including uh, a very recent one by California IOUs. That this was done in uh, cooperation with the, the California Public Utility Commission. Looked at IOU administered. Uh, investor-owned utility administered energy performance benchmarking and, and found that um, it had a tremendous impact on promoting energy efficiency investment through uh, through improved energy management processes in, in this sector, as well as encouraging uh, more comprehensive and more sophisticated technical and behavioral efficiency projects. Um, and the bench, as a result of that study, they also found that benchmarking program participants also agreed that uh, benchmarking encouraged more comprehensive whole building uh, retrofits. One of the other things that uh, we're learning about benchmarking is that it can be a great boost to uh, local economies. And, and some of the early experience coming in from New York City and San Francisco is supporting that, uh, for example, where we're hearing that energy efficiency service companies uh, in these areas where benchmarking has been put in place are seeing a 30% increase in, in business in response to local benchmarking ordinances. Um, so just having this requirement out there requiring uh, building owners to, to benchmark their properties, to rate them, and then to disclose this information can have a very significant impact on, on private sector energy efficiency uh, activities. And you know, lastly, we, we also believe that uh, benchmarking can be a great boost and, and boon to public sector entities. I mean, but first of all, again, by leading by example, uh, by having uh, public, the public sector benchmark its own buildings, uh, not only allows you to, in effect, get the bugs out before you take a, a policy initiative like this uh, more broad, uh, but it also uh, allows you to uh, show that uh, you're leading by example and that you, you view that this is a, a worthwhile activity and an, and, a, and an investment of time and resources that is important for, for government as well as the uh, private sector. Let me, uh, uh, I'd like to move to the, um, an example, some of the examples of where benchmarking is in place. Okay, I'm going to, uh, the, the first example I would like to use, and I'm going to refer to this uh, as one of my uh, key examples, is California Assembly Bill 1103. And this is a bill that was adopted in the year 2007, and uh, it was then updated in 2009 uh, to clarify that the, the California Energy Commission has authority to establish implementation rules and a schedule. And it's, it's actually effective in the year 2013, which is delayed a year from uh, the initial law that implemented it. It applies to all non-residential public and private buildings above 5,000 square feet. And uh, it requires that the Energy Star Portfolio Manager uh, rating tool be used uh, to, to do the benchmarking and to assign the rating score. Um, it also requires that uh, it, it mandates that disclosure must be made to the California Energy Commission as well as uh, potential buyers, tenants, and lenders at the time of the uh, selling the property, leasing it, or, or financing the building. It also mandates that utilities have processes in place to, to upload 12 months of energy consumption data to portfolio management uh, upon the request of a customer. And IOUs, the investor in utilities in California, are, are using EPA's uh, automated benchmarking system to help transfer that data automatically to portfolio manager. 
And uh, there's a phase in for this program. It begins with buildings over 50,000 square foot in January of 2013, uh, buildings greater than 10,000 square foot in July of 2013, and then lastly, the relatively smaller buildings over 5,000 square feet in January 2014. Uh, the state of Washington has a fairly similar law, but uh, California's, is, is, the California law is one of the most comprehensive uh, that is now been actually adopted. Next, uh, I'd like to touch on the uh, an initiative in Massachusetts. And Massachusetts has what I'm referring to as the Green Communities Act. And uh, this act was adopted in 2008, effective 2009, and it applies to non-residential public buildings. And what this uh, what this benchmarking uh, act does in, in Massachusetts, it requires local governments to put in place an energy baseline as as they develop a five-year, 20% energy reduction plan. And the idea is that they they need to have this plan in place to achieve what we refer to as green community status. And again, leading by example, uh, the idea is to have the municipalities apply this tool to their uh, their own benchmarking tool. It allows uh, communities to choose their own tool, uh, though the state has been promoting use of, of either uh, what are referred to as the Mass Energy Insight tool or the EPA Portfolio Manager tool. So they, there is an, an option there uh, for the use of different tools. Next, uh, Minnesota. And Minnesota has one of the uh, uh, the examples that has been in place the longest, and it was adopted initially in 2001 and effective in 2003. And this affects uh, property types, including non-residential uh, public buildings, and that's state, local, and school buildings larger than than 5,000 square feet. And probably the principal requirement of of this uh, program in in Minnesota is that, that it it encourages building owners to uh, benchmark uh, their buildings using a, what's referred to as a State of Minnesota B3 benchmarking tool. And uh, this compares a building's actual ener energy use to expected energy use if it was built to code. Uh, this also, this tool also automatically integrates with portfolio managers so uh, you can get a rating out of Portfolio Manager, which allows you to then qualify for an Energy Star performance score. Uh, the, the idea here with this tool in particular, it, it allows jurisdictions uh, to compare the, the energy use by various buildings so that they can really prioritize their energy efficiency investments on the buildings with the, the poorest energy performance. And then the the last uh, example that I want to use is uh, the New York City uh, Local Law 84, and this came out of the New York City's Greener Greater uh, Buildings Initiative. And I and I know on on the call is uh, at least I hope on the call is Hillary Bieber from the Mayor's Office, of New York City, who uh, can amplify on on this initiative during the discussion. But this program was adopted in 2009, effective 2011, and it affects property types, uh, essentially uh, all public buildings over 10,000 square foot, uh, and both residential and non-residential private buildings over 50,000 square foot. It requires disclosure of EPA portfolio manager benchmarking data to the city. And it phases in uh, according to a schedule of public buildings going first. Uh, that was required to take place beginning in September 2011. Non-residential buildings, September 2012. And then lastly, residential buildings, September 2013. Um, there is also automated water data transfer from the the city to affected building owners, and and that's and for the uh, customers that do have uh, automatic meter uh, reading capabilities. 
And it's also, uh, this program has also involved close cooperation with Consolidated Edison in the city in terms of the transfer of, of energy usage data. So those are uh, some of the key examples of benchmarking rating and disclosure. And one of the things that uh, the C Action Working Group has available, and I'll touch on this before I conclude, it's just a website where we do have uh, uh, fact sheets and containing information on these particular programs as well as contact information, you know, should you wish to pursue any of the programs in more detail. The next area I wanted to touch on is retro commissioning. And retro commissioning is, is one of the other areas where the, the C Action Commercial Working Group is, is working to develop some tools for state and local governments. We, we have a uh, proposed policy tool and uh, policy language on benchmarking and rating and disclosure. We are now in the process of developing a tool, a similar tool on retro commissioning. But first, um, what is it? Um, retro commissioning is it's a systematic process for identifying and, and improving less than optimal energy performance in, in an existing building's equipment and control system. And the idea is that you want to get a building performing the way it was originally designed to perform. And it's, and it's rare that buildings, uh, once they are put into operation and into use, will maintain uh, that initial level of operational efficiency. And the whole, the whole idea of retro commissioning is that it, to get existing systems working the way they should, you know, as they were designed, and then to maintain that level of performance over time. So really, uh, in that sense, retro commissioning should be thought of as a continuous monitoring and improvement process in, in the way a building is operated. Um, in contrast to retro commissioning, uh, I mean, everyone's heard of, of energy assessments and energy audits. And they are typically more narrowly focused, um, looking at particular building system components. And that can be lighting. It could be uh, heating systems, ch building chilling systems, where uh, retro commissioning is stepping back. And it, it's a more comprehensive view of how a building operates. And really making sure that uh, through prescribed maintenance practices and operator, tenant, training uh, and periodic equipment upgrades um, that you are getting the most out of your building that you really can. So why do retro commissioning? I mean, well, I, I, I mentioned how buildings quickly get out of tune and, and become less than desirable in terms of the efficiency uh, aspect. So you want to we view retro commissioning, and it's been documented to be a very cost-effective investment. Um, typically, I mean, some of the quoted costs of uh, cost of retro commissioning is it, it can range from uh, twenty-seven cents to forty-five cents per square foot per year, um, and typical paybacks in in about a year, and uh, with a range running from about half a year, in some cases up to two years. But it's a it's one of the more cost-effective things that uh, building owners, and that's whether it's uh, public sector or private sector building owners, I mean, one of the more cost-effective they, things they can do in terms of uh, uh, reducing the cost of their, their energy uh, use in a building. Um, it's, it minimizes risk of you know, dramatic failure of systems. It, it, Make sure that your fleet of buildings, if you're a public entity, are operating you know, as you believe they should. And it also, you know, it demonstrates to the public that, um, and it builds trust and confidence that you are uh, properly managing taxpayer dollars uh, with your fleet of buildings. And uh, many of the public sector entities around the country maintain substantial fleets of building. Uh, New York City, again, as an example, well over 4,000 public buildings that are in the city's building's portfolio that uh, 
you can imagine the retro commissioning benefits uh, that would result from applying such an init a policy initiative on a, such a very large scale. The next area that we're focusing on is what I'm referring to as strategic energy management. And once again, getting rid of my uh, screensaver. Um, so what is uh, strategic energy management? I mean, it, it's a it's trying to get away from uh, focusing on single technology, one-time solutions, uh, such as replacing lighting equipment or cooling equi equipment, to a broader, uh, uh, tr uh, and what we refer to as a holistic approach to energy management that sets long-term goals and, and systematically monitors progress at the building and organizational level. And, and really, at its fundamental heart, it's, it's uh, putting accountability into uh, building energy management or buildings energy management. And account it, it provides uh, building managers with the information uh, needed to really understand um, whether you're achieving your long-term energy saving goals. And it, it provides you with a rigorous tracking and reporting system that can help drive energy savings and, and reach across entire building portfolios to try to uh, achieve the maximum energy efficiency savings that you know, are out there and on the table. Uh, so why strategic energy management? Um, it increases energy savings and savings persistence. It, I mean, it doesn't, it, uh, it, it basically keeps your feet to the fire to make sure that energy savings that you're achieving in the short term are actually uh, continuous over time and it dovetails very closely with the retro commissioning initiatives that I just finished speaking about but strategic energy management is really um, putting in place a, a mechanism for governments uh, to strategically manage the energy use within their their fleet of properties and the last area that I want to talk about is high performance leasing. And uh, many of you have heard about the, uh, the split incentives problem that's faced by tenant and property owners where tenants will typically pay the energy bills where uh, property owners therefore have no real incentive to make investments in the properties to make the buildings, uh, the properties more energy efficient. And oftentimes, the, the owners of the properties cannot recover the cost of those investments. So high-performance leasing involves strategies to try to overcome those barriers. And, come, and coming up with some model leasing terms is one of the areas where we, we believe that we can uh, provide some value. Um, in addition to addressing the split incentive barrier, it, it, our objective is to try to help transform the leasing market towards more sustainable practices. And one of our objectives is to have model leases and, and other tools that are available um, that can be used by uh, state and local governments as when working with your, your real estate industry to try to get some of these innovative ideas that are being uh, tried at various, at various entities around the country uh, into practice. So. Um, Given these various initiatives, how might one get involved? And um, I touched on a few areas, but the Commercial Working Group has a number of resources that are available. There, there are fact sheets that have been prepared uh, on benchmarking, uh, building rating and disclosure, retro commissioning, high performance leasing, and strategic energy management programs. And, and these fact sheets are available uh, through the uh, the C Action uh, web page, and you can go to the Commercial Working Group page for those fact sheets. We are also developing uh, model policy design guides, and the idea of these design guides is to provide a, a framework and suggested policy language for state and local governments as you adopt uh, various 
energy policy initiatives, or we're trying to encourage you to adopt energy policy initiatives. And what we have done is we've taken actual language from uh, legislation or statutes and, and other government uh, initiatives to try to give you the tools that you need to uh, create some uh, draft policy uh, documents that, that you might float within your own jurisdictions and you might discuss with, with stakeholders. The uh, benchmarking and disclosure policy guide is is now available and it's uh, through the commercial working group working page, uh, a web page, and we have the retro commissioning uh, policy guide uh, is also going to be available later this year and that will also uh, include key language from uh, legislation and, and laws that have been put in place around the country. And lastly, uh, besides the fact sheets and model policy design guides, the objective of the working group is to provide expert and uh, peer support where it would be helpful. And we have the, the working group is made up of a, a wide range of, of parties from different backgrounds, including background in buildings, uh, energy policy advisors, practitioners, uh, building owners, and uh, utilities. And the, these volunteers who are on the working group uh, uh, working to try to achieve the goals of the commercial building uh, working group are, are dedicated to providing uh, assistance to, to states and local governments uh, around the country that are interested in pursuing uh, these objectives and, and trying to implement programs along the lines of what I just uh, went over. And uh, by providing not just the language and the fact sheets, but uh, also providing uh, support as necessary and even one-on-one -on -one support should you have questions about uh, how an actual program or policy was implemented that people uh, hope to be of assistance. And you know, lastly, uh, the, the last slide that I have on, on my component, my section of this presentation is how state governments can can get involved. Um, you know, first and foremost, you know, take a look at the uh, the C Action resources. We have a web page address right there for the commercial working group, and you can you can see these things that I've been referring to the the fact sheets and the the model policy documents. Um, we also want to hear more about what you are doing. I mean, if you have initiatives that are underway that uh, you believe we should be uh, told, uh, informed about, please write to uh, Cody Taylor, who is uh, with DOE, and Cody has been a uh, key participant in the working group and, and organizer. And uh, we want to know what you're up to. So you know, please. Uh, uh, send us information about what you're up to as well as uh, any data that you might have. Um, if you have also if you have any interest in, in, uh, in working with us on implementation of, of pilot programs. And uh, lastly, feel free to uh, request assistance. Uh, if there's a particular policy or program that you're interested in learning more about, you know, please let us know. And, and uh, not on this slide, but I, I want to mention we are extremely interested in, in uh, getting uh, more people in, who are from uh, legislative uh, backgrounds or roles involved in our work and our initiatives. So we, we really uh, welcome your involvement in joining our, our effort. And we can talk about that in a little bit more detail, but at this point I wanted to uh, turn it over to Marshall, uh, who will go into a more detail about what uh, District of Columbia is doing in the whole area of uh, building energy performance and benchmarking. Marshall, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I was just, um, I'm here. I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, okay. I was just, I thought that was going to be an introduction. Yeah, but, but by the way, I was just about to jump in. This is uh, Glenn with NTSL. Um, thanks so much for your presentation, Jim. And uh, again, just wanted to repeat, if you do have any questions, just type them in, and uh, we will answer them as we, uh, as we proceed here. 
So uh, our next uh, speaker is Marshall Dewar-Bocking, and uh, Marshall is a program analyst for the Building Energy Benchmarking in the Office of Policy and Sustainability at the District Department of the Environment. He manages the implementation of Washington, D.C.'s Building Energy Benchmarking Program and contributes to the development of the district's ambitious sustainability plan. So let's uh, welcome Marshall. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'll just um, I'll try to move through this as quickly as I can because I'm aware of the time. Um, next slide, please. So I guess I want us to just start out painting a little bit of a bigger picture before I de delve down here. And I want you to sort of take a moment and imagine what it would be like if we didn't have any labels or other ways to know whether or not a car was really efficient or, or, the, or a refrigerator or other appliance or how, how our food would affect our health. Click. Um, can you click forward? But we do. We do have, we have EPA fuel economy estimates, we have energy guides, we have nutrition facts, and we increasingly have pushes to make calorie data and menu labels and so forth bigger. So this is a familiar concept um, that's been very effective. And what we're really trying to do here is apply it to a new area. Next slide. Now, obviously, we're not actually going to put stickers on any buildings, <laughs> but right now, that's where we are with 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 building energy. We don't know. People don't know how much energy the building uses, so they can't take that into account when they're thinking about leasing or buying. And and people who consultants and others who want to help buildings reduce energy costs can't get the kind of demand that they really is needed for their services. Next slide. Okay, no, that's won't have that long transition. Um, so why did DC decide to go down this route? Um, the first thing, of course, is we were concerned, we we're aware that benchmarking is a major cost um, for building, op building operators. Um, the recent study by BOMA, Building Operating Manager Association, put it at 32% of operating costs. Now, in comparison to the amount of income generated from rent, for example, it's a really small indicator in percent, and a small percentage change in occupancy is going to have a much bigger effect on the balance sheet than utility costs. But as we, are, as Jim already alluded to, increased energy efficiency can increase um, increase occupancy rates. And then for DC um, buildings, because we're a highly built environment, highly urban environment, building and without a lot of industry built. Buildings are our largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for 75% of all energy um, energy use in the city. And within that, the commercial building sector is 50% of all energy use in the city. So it's 50% of all building energy use well, countrywide, but it's 50% of all of our energy use. So this is clearly the sector we had to go to. And most buildings are, that are going to be around next years and next 20 years have already been built. So we had to look at the existing buildings. Next slide. I'm just going to skip through a little, a little bit of this, but just to reiterate that bench, studies show that benchmarking drives investment. Facility managers who use benchmarking, two-thirds of them plus, have used it to guide efficiency plans or justify efficiency projects. Next slide. And uh, different studies show different um, increases between 5% and as much as 20% on the occupant, on occupancy rates, rental pricing, and sale pricing the buildings are able to compete if, if they're energy star labeled. Now, if they're not energy star labeled, but they're still pretty efficient, pretty darn efficient, how are you going to know? And that's where a policy like DC's comes in. Next slide. Um, DC in 2008 passed the Clean Affordable Energy Act, um, which put public benchmarking of using energy star portfolio manager for all public buildings over 10,000 square feet beginning 2010 with 2009 data. Um, and publicly reporting the scores, and then for private buildings, benchmarking with 50,000 square feet, phased in by size, down to that level. Um, it was a, and then public reporting of scores with the second year. And in respect to the public reporting, DC's law was the first in the country. Um, due to a number of factors, DC has been somewhat slower in implementation, and New York City and some other cities are ahead of us. Um, but we are we're finalizing our regulations, and we're expecting to be collecting data later this year. So we're moving quickly. Um, and I'm going to try to, as we go, go through this, touch on a few places where DC's special status as a district and analogous to a state in some ways um, creates different benefits for us than um, for New York City or another city. Next slide. Um, so we'll just, uh, I'll 
touch really quickly. So we already mentioned the New York City program. Seattle, San Francisco, and Austin all now have similar benchmarking programs in various stages of implementation. Um, New York City, Seattle, and San Francisco are already collecting data. Um, Austin now too since the past few days. Um, and you can see right there that the threshold you choose has a massive effect on the amount of buildings. New York City's law, 50,000 local to 16,000 buildings. Seattle went down to 10,000. And they have half as many buildings that they have to collect data from as New York City, even though Seattle is less than a tenth the size. DC, it's again 50,000, 1,500 buildings. And again, emphasizing how much of a benefit this has been for communities in uh, the local economy. I mean, um, in New York City, so a lot of the benchmarking was done by consultants, and um, there's, there are good studies out there that show the business opportunities that have been created by benchmarking policies. And then also I want to acknowledge, and we'll talk about this more later, but Department of Energy has really been really beneficial in designing common platforms for us all to use for storing this data. Next slide. All right, in thinking, in going through this and thinking about this, I wanted to sort of think about some, what are, to my mind, the key decision points that DC had to make in, in, in putting this legislation in place and implementing this policy, and the key, thus the key decision points that you, as people working on legislatures in other states, would also have to consider. Um, and I'll go through each of them and talk about what DC has done, why DC made the decision it did. Um, so we'll put, next slide. First off, why use Energy Star Portfolio Manager as, another, as opposed to another tool? As Jim said, in Minnesota, in Massachusetts, there are places that have designed their own custom tools. So why use EPA's tool? Um, Start as I want to clarify, it's an operational rating, which does make it different than some of the asset rating work that is going on in Massachusetts, which is also very important. And the difference that there is between the operations, the actual cost, energy being consumed by the building, as we know, and what it could be consuming based on it, what it's built, uh, asset rating being more tightly tied to the uh, investment by the owner. Um, energy, Star, energy Star has a really strong brand awareness, over 70 percent, and the Portfolio Manager tool particularly has a track record, a long track record that's been around for over a decade. It was originally designed for the rating for commercial buildings. You can actually get an Energy Star rating for a building the way you can for appliance. Um, and it was designed for bonds for that, but now DC and New York City and other cities and states are you being able to use it for the purposes of mandatory benchmarking. It's free, it's online, it's relatively easy to use, and it's about to get a lot easier with a major upgrade that um, they're putting out next summer. Um, it, for many types of buildings, it does generate this 1 to 100 score, um, but even if it do, for a building type that doesn't generate a score, such as a multifamily property or a museum, for example, um, you still get a lot of useful metrics and energy use intensity and other things that, that is really useful information to have. And then EPA has provides a lot of support training materials. They've designed custom reporting forms for the jurisdictions that have mandates to use. They've been really helpful, and so having that support from the federal level is really great. Um, and you can see the dramatic rise that's going on. Um, I don't that graph, but the dramatic rise that's going on in buildings that have been benchmarked with Industry Portfolio Manager. Next slide. The next decision, of course, is the class of the buildings that you're going to apply to. Um, obviously, DC, like most places, chose to start with public buildings to lead by example, and then to go to large commercial buildings and to multifamily buildings. Um, in DC, in particular, there's a very high adoption rate of, uh, already of benchmarking among large commercial buildings but because of requirements from the federal government that if you want to lease to the federal government, you have to be Energy Star certified. Um, but there's lower adoption rate amongst small buildings and in the multifamily sector in particular. Um, whether or not you have this applying only to commercial buildings or to multi large multifamily buildings as well depends really on the stock of buildings. It makes a lot of sense in places with large stocks of multifamily buildings like New York City and DC. Um, and it's going to make increasing amounts of sense if EPA is, in fact, successful, as they expect to be, in unveiling a rating for the multifamily sector again next summer. Um, I'll admit that DC didn't initially intend to include multifamily. The law does include them, and we have worked really hard to work with the multifamily sector to bring them on board and support it, and made a lot of progress in that area. Next slide, please. Um, the next, of course, decision would be your thresholds and your phasing. Why we chose 50,000 square feet? is because of the really the economies of scale. 50,000 square feet for the commercial buildings here, you have 10% of the number of buildings in the city and 73% of the building area. That's a massive amount of leverage. And with larger buildings, you have a 
relatively sophisticated class of owners as opposed to small buildings where you end up with an owner who owns one small property, et cetera. Next, next click, please. Um, DC also chose to phase in over a period of years as opposed to getting all in one year, starting with 200,000 and above, going down to 150, 100, and then 50. As you can see, we're a little bit behind the original scheduled reporting deadlines versus what we're projecting because of the ongoing rulemaking process, but we do anticipate being back on track pretty quickly. And again, it's been very helpful to get this phase in insofar as it's the, the larger buildings are already very much on board. Many of them are doing this already, and I know people call me ch chomping at the bit to submit their data, which is sort of not the kind of situation you sort of end up in usually in a regulatory context. Um, Next slide, please. Um, the next one more comment on um, thresholds is you can either have it apply to have it phased in by when the building type report as we did, or in New York City, it applied all, all at once to all 50,000 bucks, but there's a phase in in terms of the public disclosure. So that's an option. Um, so the next thing is data access, and this is something I think a lot of, a lot of us come to understand It's a major issue and a major problem and a major key to success, but wasn't fully understood um, originally, which is that owners can't always easily access tenant data. Uh, and utility companies here can provide the solution through automated upload to portfolio manager and also through the provision of aggregate whole building data. And that's where the building owner contacts the utility company, says, I own this building, I want to have the data, and, the build, and there's a confirmation process of who the tenants are, and then all the data is added together and a single number uploaded for each month, uploaded to Portfolio Manager, thus eliminating the privacy concerns that would otherwise um, surround building owners having to ask all of their tenants for data, which is difficult in any context and pretty infeasible with large multifamily buildings. In New York City and Seattle and Chicago, Chicago doesn't have a mandatory policy, but in New York City and Seattle has been really critical to the success of these policies. When New York City, when Con Ed implemented um, auto, the ability to get aggregate data compliance rates, I believe in New York City, Hillary can confirm this during the question and answer, would jump double, I believe, um, and now over 80%. Um, Chicago doesn't have a mandatory policy, but the comment did do the, take the progressive step of making automated aggregate data upload, and it dramatically, possible, and dramatically increased the number of buildings benchmarked. Um, BOMA, the Real Estate Roundtable, um, USGBC, and Supermarket Transformation, and others have formed an alliance to work with utilities and regulators called the Data Alliance, Data Access and Transparency. And the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners has passed a resolution calling on state commissions to provide better access to, to this commercial data. Um, next slide, please. And this is one area where, as a state, you have a lot of advantage over a city trying to implement this policy, and where DC has some of the benefits from being a district, which I'll grant up front that we still don't have access to ag aggregate data here in DC, and that we're working to make that happen. Um, but states, of course, have the power to compel utility companies to provide aggregate data and provide automated uploading. Um, in the latter case, that's what happened in, in California, as Jim alluded to, um, in, and in New, York, in New York City, the Public Service Commission really was um, instrumental in getting Con Ed to do this as well. Um, what we would advise, and what sort of I think if we were doing this all over again, what we would have done would be to have the, um, making the legislation actually mandate aggregate data access and upload and make it required well before the first deadline um, so that by the time anyone has to actually be benchmarking and reporting, the service is available and it's working and, and utility company isn't deluged with a huge amount of requests in a you know, several month period. Um, and in the C, C action model policy that Jim mentioned, um, this is exactly how it's laid out. How it's laid out. Um, and as I said, DDOE is now working to, after the fact, allow this to happen um, in DC and in the interim world, allowing in the multifamily sector buildings to only report common area space if they're separately metered, which is an interim solution. But, um, but is better than any kind of extrapolation or other thing you could do. Um, next slide, please. So to lay that. Um, next decision, of course, is, and the final major one I want to touch on is why public disclosure? Why, why is it important? To, it's important to get building owners to do this because you can't manage, or you don't measure, you want to drive energy use reductions, you want to have people in the long term saving money. But why is it important to be disclosing this information to the public? Um, and what I've illustrated here is that you have a 
positive feedback loop, a virtuous cycle from waiting, waitings for buildings and disclosure to the market, comparing of building performance, rewarding of energy efficient properties with more business, improvement of efficiency health competitiveness, and then a continuous improvement of the building stock and a continuous pressure for, for this. You're harnessing essentially the power of the free market to drive efficiency by making, by make, by making information freely available um, and making the market able to function more properly because otherwise you don't have equal access to information. Transactional disclosure is an option that a lot of places have taken, Washington State, California, so forth. Um, and it does, in fact, provide some of this information to the market, but it's our belief here in D.C. that it provides less leverage because you don't have, it's because you only get, only certain parties are getting the data. And in some cases, they may be getting the data too late to back out of a decision. You don't have the sort of public pressure of buildings that um, want to advertise themselves as being green but aren't actually energy efficient, putting pressure on those. And of course, it's also harder to enforce. And if you want to try to enforce a transaction disclosure, you're inserting the government at a state in, into private transactions, private lease transactions, in a way that really hasn't been before. So arguably, even though it seems less intrusive, in a way you could see transactional disclosure. As Just a perspective. Next slide, please. Um, so what DC is choosing to publish, um, Web truck results are going to be made public in the second year of reporting for each building type, um, for each building that reports. Um, we'll make the results public online um, and using the, Dep the Department of Energy C database, which then is going to have the ability for third parties to build applications to pull that data in. So you can imagine visual maps of, you know, with color coded of the energy use of the buildings in a city or a area. You can imagine augmented reality things on phones that allow you to point your phone at a building and see how much energy it uses. The possibilities really for the private sector to do this are endless if, this, if, the, if the government only collects the data and then makes it available for you. Um, next, uh, click please. Um, because we are collecting um, partial building data in some cases due to not having aggregate utility, we're going to make a very clear effort to distinguish that. And I've listed here the energy information that we're going to be making public, the address, the year built, the rating, the intensity, energy use intensity, um, the raw energy use. We're collecting water data as well, emissions, building area, space type. It's kind of cut off there. That's it. Um, next slide, please. Just to touch a little bit on um, the roadblocks that DC has faced um, in implementing this. Um, one key one that uh, would be, of course, a lack of dedicated funding sources appropriated in the legislation for implementation which leads to staff that are split between multiple programs and less ability to implement this. And I think there was also a lack of awareness earlier on of the degree of staff time that was going to be needed. Um, there was this shift to realizing that the law did include the residential sector, which required a lot more outreach and rethinking of, of the approach. Um, and it has been more complex than initially anticipated details like how do you address multiple buildings on a, tech, on a lot, um, we did it by meters, how do you address retail tenants? Building owners didn't want to include them. We said it's a whole building rating. You have to include that. And once you get aggregate data, it's a new point. How do you address certain high energy intensity tenants, et cetera? Um, and of course, the IT need, there were serious IT needs, but DOE has really stepped into the breach and provided a really benefit there. Um, the data access challenges have already alluded to. And then we've really made a lot of effort to provide energy stock reform mental trainings, outreach, and we're continuing to expand those efforts. Um, here in DC um, as we roll this out. Um, next slide. And I just had a couple thoughts that I wanted to share um, thinking about what's happening in DC and elsewhere as you think about implementing this at, this, at a state level. Um, and one thing that's sort of critical is the importance of building support among sort of larger progressive real estate stakeholders to develop, help develop policy and involve them in the process. In DC, a lot of the largest building owners were already benchmarking there, as I said, really eager to submit their data and have the, have the world know how efficient their buildings are, relatively speaking. Um, and they understand what this is and they're very supportive and, and that's been really helpful. Um, often you're building off a state level, of many states, your building operator and manager associations will be representing small to medium assets mainly. So you need these big owners to really say, this is, this is, we're doing this already, this is how it benefits us, this is how it's going to benefit you. And then, of course, if you pick a threshold at 50,000, you're also not having to deal with as many small buildings anyway. Um, the other co concept here is that the state can provide an enabling environment. If the state, if the state legislature is, for one reason or another, unable to go sort of all the way, um, it can provide an enabling 
environment for cities to go further. And Washington State is a great example here. As Jim said, there's a state law in Washington. State law requires benchmarking at time of transaction only. It only applies to the commercial sector, and it doesn't require disclosure to the government. Uh, for some questions. Um, but in, in Seattle then built on that, referencing that law, and then went further, requiring benchmarking every year. Expanded it to apply to multifamily and requiring the still transaction of the city also that's disclosed also to the city. Um, next slide, please. Um, and just to sort of in conclusion, just want to sort of highlight again that mandatory benchmarking is good for building owners, but it's also really, um, and it's good for state policy and planning because once you have this, you're opening up access to granular energy consumption data that we really haven't had access to before, and. And then you can increase fiscal responsibility and you can increase the impact of incentive programs by targeting areas of greatest need as opposed to picking winners or throwing money away. And it really builds the, uh, builds, can build trust in government and the um, responsibility of that. And again, the auction policy design guide is a really good starting point. And I'm just really glad to see that out there. Um, I think that's it. But we can go to the next slide and see. Yeah, I'm done. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take questions at the end. Thanks, Marshall. Uh, we did have one, one question if you want to answer it now. Um, and that sure. question was really about what other benchmarking programs exist besides Energy Star and which are the, uh, what might be the most uh, effective or uh, popular. Um, so there are, the answer to that is twofold. There are a number um, of private sector bench, um, companies that have other benchmarking products that use methodologies similar to or different to portfolio manager. For obvious reasons, we wanted to pick a free um, provided by the government thing as opposed to picking any private sector company. Um, and then I know, and then as I said, Energy Star is a, a, a an operational base. Um, asset rating is a different matter and Department of Energy in Massachusetts and other places are working on coming together with a rating system for that that can really work. I don't think there's a really good model out there yet, to my knowledge, but I'll let Cody Taylor speak to that uh, further. Um, thank you. Okay, thanks. Our, our next panelist is, uh, is Bill Prindle. He is one of America's foremost experts on energy efficiency policies and technologies, and is currently the Vice President of ICF International. At ICF, he helps lead, lead the firm's energy efficiency division, which supports federal, state, and local government as well as utility and corporate clients in designing and implementing energy efficiency policies and programs. So again, uh, let's welcome uh, Bill Prindle. And also, uh, please enter your questions. Uh, feel free to enter them at any time during the uh, presentation. We will answer them at the end. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Glenn. I'm, I'm really standing in for Cody Taylor at DOE, who is traveling to give yet another talk on these subjects uh, today. Uh, ICF is supporting DOE on this uh, C action, existing commercial buildings work, and we also um, provide a lot of the support to EPA for Energy Star buildings, including the portfolio manager software, and so we're pretty deeply involved in these issues. Uh, let's roll forward. Next slide. And so I just wanted to fill you in on a few of the parallel activities kind of behind the curtain that are really uh, kind of and kind of boring in one way, but kind of essential to make this whole evolving policy scene work. And if you will, think of this like the Internet, where you know most of us have become uh, users of the Internet for a lot of purposes, and we rely on it for quick uh, access to information, for comparing products, shopping online, and you know, you know, work research and everything else. But the only reason that the Internet works the way it does is that there is a ton of Data conventions, software uh, conventions that are that allow uh, applications builders to use the same set, the same language essentially. So, uh, DOE and others are collaborating to build, if you will, the the data infrastructure to support a whole range of energy efficiency uh, policy and program initiatives. What, one of them is what you see here in this slide. It's the, a building's performance database, which is trying to get uh, really high quality uh, data on a lot of buildings available on a comparative and searchable basis so that we can, you know, as we do more and more operational ratings and asset ratings of buildings, uh, we can get more data into a common database format 
and this becomes a more and more powerful tool. There's a website, a URL, uh, at the bottom of this slide, so I won't go into a lot of detail on this except to encourage those of you who are interested to go to that URL. Of course, the Uniform Resource Locator, the URL, is one of those conventions <laughs> without which <laughs> the Internet wouldn't work, so it's, it's really the same principle. Let's go to slide 41. Uh, this is just a schematic of how the building performance database works. One of the, the key, um, one of the key elements of the database is having a common taxonomy or set of definitions for what data elements to include from buildings. So you really are comparing not just apples to apples, but apple stems to apple stems, apple seeds to apple seeds, and and so forth. Uh, I won't. Um, I don't really dwell on this, except one. the only other point is uh, on the, uh, the fourth green bullet down there, there's something called an API, which is an application programming interface, which is a, you know, a software geek's term for the, uh, the flexibility that allows third parties to generate apps, the things that we all have on our smartphones now. It's very easy when you have an API uh, open uh, architecture format to develop any number of applications so that people who want to use this database can build their own applications for whatever they need and it's an open and, and uh, cost-effective way to do that. Next slide. Uh, DOE is also building the Standard Energy Efficiency Data Platform or SEED. Um, and Marshall alluded to this once or twice during his presentation. And in fact, Marshall is one of the beta users for the SEED platform. And the idea here is really to create a, another public domain software tool that uses a common set of data definitions so local governments that are trying to implement benchmarking can manage this massive amount of data that's going to be <laughs> flooding in from buildings. And uh, you also notice there's an open API box there that, that allows third parties to do whatever's needed, whether it's an individual building owner or a consultant supporting the program or somebody else. Uh, the idea is to have an open architecture so that uh, the market can really use this data. Let's flip forward to slide 43. And you know, there's there's some obvious benefits here for innovation and efficient and efficiency. Uh, data is really the currency on which energy efficiency happens at scale, and so we need to have these sometimes boring, <laughs> but nonetheless essential features, so that we can really begin to see into the key elements of performance in those hundred plus million buildings we have around the country. Next slide. I won't go through all 10 blocks on this diagram. This is just to show that uh, folks have thought through how states act and how building owners act in going through a process that uses the tools like Portfolio Manager and Seed. Um, it looks complicated, but once you have the data infrastructure set up and you have automation so that data can be fed from utilities, uh, data can be fed from portfolio manager to seed and so forth. Uh, it's actually uh, a very efficient and low cost process, but it takes the complexity of someone operating behind the curtain to, to make that possible, just like the internet. So next slide forward. Uh, just a briefing on where seed is at now. The, the beta was launched earlier this year and um, DC is one of a, a, a few of the cities that are trying it out. Um, there's work ongoing to uh, work out kinks, make the functionalities better, and so forth, and to create this application programming interface. And you know, then then there's a little bit of outreach work to make people aware of it and help them learn how to use it, and so on. Next slide. Uh, the, um, the difference between operational ratings and asset ratings has come up a few times in Jim and Marshall's talk. A portfolio manager is, is an operational rating. It basically says, 
this is this is how much energy your building is using today compared to other buildings or compared to some other benchmark. And that just tells you how well the building is being run. There, there may be some technical factors inside that building that explain how well it's performing, but the operational rating is simply, okay, here's how many BTUs per square foot and so on. The asset rating is the more technical tool that looks inside the building, assesses its it's building envelope, it's lighting systems, heating, cooling systems, and says, okay, so here's what you actually have in the building, and here's where the improvement opportunities are. So the two really work in tandem. You typically use a, an operational rating uh, to find out where your building stands, and then you use the asset rating to identify improvement opportunities. Hopefully then the improvements show up in the operational rating, so on and so forth. So that is uh, a quick tour for what's going on behind the scenes. I think we're now ready for Q&A. We just flip forward, and uh, Cody Taylor's contact info is on there, as are Marshall and Jim's. Uh, Glenn, I'll turn it back to you and um, field any questions. Sure. Thanks. We did have uh, one more question here. What, how does the private sector participate formally in uh, the CE action uh, um, efforts? Well, this, this is Jim. Um, you know, we'd be happy to uh, have private sector participation either um, by participating on the working group. You know, uh, you're welcome to materials uh, through the web resources. Uh, and also, if there's a, you know, something that you'd like to do in a bilateral way, you know, just uh, uh, talking to any of us about possible joint initiatives, um, you know, please feel free to contact either Cody or me. Great. And again, we, we will actually be sending out a link to, uh, to um, some of this, these resources and a link to the uh, presentations and a recording to this uh, webinar as well to all participants. Um, we have another question. How, how uh, crucial is the adoption of the latest building and energy codes to achieving uh, the goals that the action is set out. Well, uh, this is Bill. I can take a crack at that because I worked on building codes myself. Building codes, of course, affect primarily new buildings. I mean, the existing buildings are affected if they're doing work that's major enough to require a building permit. Uh, but the codes are affecting primarily new construction. The C action existing buildings working group is focusing on the existing uh, building. You know, for in today's construction uh, business, uh, even in the best of years, a decade ago, we would only add one to two percent to the building stock in a given year. That leaves the other ninety-eight or ninety-nine percent out there, uh, probably needing some help in many cases. So, uh, building codes will over time have an effect in driving better performance. Uh, but we're also finding that the way buildings are actively managed uh, can also make a big difference. And so the Energy Star Buildings Program has been operating on that, that principle for many years and, and seems to be able to find a lot of savings, even in buildings that were designed to run well. Um, but they, you know, they have to be actively managed in order to do that. So I, I guess the final question here, it looks like, is. Um, the, the effect of this on, on not just actual um, capital investments, but also the since there's such a, a large impact on energy use that is behavioral, what is the kind of, um, I guess on these rating systems, how, how does this impact also the behavioral component? Well, I think the, this is Jim. You know, the behavioral side of this is key. I mean, it's providing information, you know, much as Marshall was describing, that will will help inform decisions. And you know, the the hope and, and what we're beginning to see from you know early practice is that building owners will want to make their buildings more attractive and more valuable, and that. Uh, tenants and prospective buyers of buildings, you know,
tend to prefer uh, more efficient, less costly buildings that are that are also potentially more valuable. So it's really, it's it's. Uh, I mean, what I see is the beauty of this is it's it's providing the marketplace with information that allows the market to work in a way that's consistent with with public policy objectives, and it's doing it initially without. Um, Heavy subsidies or heavy, you know, incentives. It's uh, um, driving the interest of uh, the marketplace to lower costs and increase value. And uh, this is Bill. I would add only that uh, with the deployment of smart grid technology in more and more states, uh, advanced metering is coming into place, which at least for some. Um, some folks in the marketplace provides an even richer set of data to be able to manage the building better. For example, if you've got hourly data for a large office complex, um, you can begin to look a lot deeper into the way your building is actually managed, and you can begin to identify, okay, so why are we using all that energy on Friday nights <laughs> when nobody is supposed to be in the building, or things like that. And that that's a tool that can enable uh, owners and managers to really uh, to really go deeper with operational efficiency. It's not um, you know that kind of granular data is actually not required yet in the public benchmarking policies. But what happens is that some of the more um, uh, some of the more progressive building owners and managers use the benchmarking data as a, as a trigger to go out and get better data. Like, we need, we need better data. Why, why is our building so, uh, so far behind the market average? You know, we, let's, let's go get some, uh, some better data and see what we can do to, to drive improvement. Well, with that, th th thanks a lot uh, for, for the answers and taking the time to share this information with us. Uh, it was quite beneficial. and. Uh, and CISEL continues to, to do some work in this area. We also track uh, legislation on this type of um, on, the, on this type on these type of policies in our legislative uh, database, um, which which Julie actually manages. And uh, we will also send out a link to that and some of our updates in that area. Um, again, this was recorded and will be available to um, be viewed in the future. And we'll be sending out that email soon. And so let's let's thank. Uh, give a thanks to uh, Jim Gallagher, Marshall uh, Dewar Bocking, and uh, Bill Prindle for uh, sharing this information with us. And we look forward to um, presenting for you again in our uh, next NCSL Energy webinar. Thank you.